Good evening and welcome to tonight's Driver's Ed class. Week four. So this is the week where we'll uh, talk about winter weather today. And then tomorrow we'll get into alcohol and drugs. We'll talk about behaviors and attitudes tomorrow. And then on Thursday, we'll be talking about penalties. So please sign in. Remember, you got to uh, sign in on your phone. So I've got record that you're here. Uh, by looking on YouTube, I get to see who's here and I can ask questions too. Uh, on the top corner, I have availability for driving. So tomorrow I have 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. So at some point, I would like people to text me later on tonight. Uh, let me know what you have for availability. I know everything's going to get turned upside down now that we're losing Wednesday as being a day that we used to get a lot of driving done. Now that they're having you come back to school, uh, everything's changing. And I realize that. But we are also into our last couple weeks of driver's ed. So I want to try to get as many of you that are ready to be finished to, to finish up. So uh, please take availability of these drive times. Uh, think about what, what uh, Thursday and Friday will look like, and we will go from there um, on Thursday and Friday. And then next week, of course, is no class. We have no class during school vacation, and it will be devoted to driving. So I am fair game for eight o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night. Um, I'm ready to rock and roll uh, so we can get some driving done. So that's what we want to do. Uh, I'll try to put this up a little bit later um, so we can see um, the times again. So uh, you'll be able to choose that. But I wanted to uh, finish up on the topic of road rage. So last Thursday, uh, we basically talked about driving emergencies and uh, the very last part of class was road rage. And I showed you a couple. Let me get right out of out of here. Let's stop the music. And I asked you to do for your homework, which was a couple articles. Uh, send me the link or give me a overview of what happened and basically what could have been different and what your attitudes and feelings about the incident was. Because I wanted to basically kind of bring home to you is that every time that you get behind the wheel of a car, emotions come into play and emotions are very strong. And when you get somebody that's very volatile, someone that acts out normally, this is to say that they're in a classroom. So if they act out normally in a classroom, they're going to act out behind the wheel of a car. So we're going to take a look at the mental aspect of road rage and we're also going to take a look at the physical aspect and what are our choices what can we do differently about road rage so i didn't cue it up i know this was what we saw at the beginning so i'm just going to kind of get i'm going to show you a, a 2020 video that uh 2020 abc uh reporting did probably about four or five years ago we'll see that at the very end of the PowerPoint. What I'd like you to write down is because there is a distinction between these two emotions. I want you to write down the word anger and mad. Anger is a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. Mad, completely unrestrained by reason and judgment. It's a fit or mood of bad temper. When we think of someone having a, a tantrum, we probably think of a young child. You know, just dropping to the ground, kicking, screaming, and not really being able to reason out the situation. So in your notes, I want you to understand being angry is normal. It's a rationale emotion that everybody has, maybe not every day, but probably every week. 
Uh, let me give you an example. If I was to give you a homework assignment tonight for a two page typewritten report with references, most of you probably would not be very happy. You'd be very displeased, per, probably pretty annoyed by what I just gave you. But I, I don't think anybody would act out uh, online. I don't think you'd make any comments. You'd probably do it under your breath. Um, if we were in a classroom, someone who's mad may get up and leave the room. Someone may throw a water bottle up against the wall or something if they don't get what they want. So it, it's more extreme. It's more um, out there. And all the articles that I wanted you to find, and some of you really did a good job with getting some of the articles, were extreme. We're talking about guns. We're talking about physical confrontation, um, knives, uh, all, all things that you wouldn't associate with driving, at least confronting somebody that you've uh, found to be out driving on your way to school or work. Now, I also wanted to you to write down is that road rage doesn't have to be something that you have to get involved in. So road rage, uh, you can control. And this was a good example. I found this uh, many years ago where a young mom um, basically had someone drive past her that gave her the middle finger. And I think she probably was maybe driving slower, going the speed limit. But it says further down the road, uh, the Jeep that gave her the finger had crashed and burned off to the side of the road. And rather than drive by, this woman pulled over and untangled the trapped girl from her seatbelt and called 911. So it says here at the bottom, I wasn't thinking about karma, but at the same time, I could uh, never just sit there and watch um, what was happening, meaning the car go up in flames. So you don't have to hold a grudge. You don't have to act out. As a, a sibling, have you ever had a brother or sister that did something to you? Let's say that, you know, pushed you. So you push back and then they push back a little bit heavy. It basically escalates. So what I want you to realize, realize road rage is an incident of escalation. It's basically where something isn't resolved. It is going to a peak, and the peak is usually uh, not the outcome that you want. I don't think anybody that has had any of these road rage incidents, once they take a step back, you know, they calm down for a moment, they think about how stupid things were. And I think I gave you the video from the guy from New Hampshire who said, I, I really don't know why I acted out like I did. I wasn't thinking. And that's the, the thing about road rage is you're just going on emotions. Now, why would someone ever suffer from road rage? Some of the reasons is that you get somebody behind you that's running late. Uh, so you're holding them up. Someone that likes to drive fast and you're going slower than they are. Um, doesn't see traffic, meaning they pull right out in front of you and that tail and that gets you. Of course, tailgater is probably right up there at the top. Um, people flip out when they get past. It's like, hey, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Why, why are you passing me? Uh, parking spots. When you're waiting to take a parking spot and someone, you know, jumps right in front of you and, and takes that, especially in the wintertime around Christmas, it can be very, very annoying. I don't have this video. This was from Malcolm in the Middle. Um, I can tell you basically what happens here is that that woman approaches the car to the right the tan colored car and the woman in the blue vehicle backs up and scrapes the tan car and the woman in the tan car goes hey you could have at least said i'm sorry and the woman in the blue car says well it's not like i'm doing any real damage to your car it's not really worth much and they kind of go back and forth and what you see in this little clip is it just escalates they go around the parking lot. It's almost like bumper cars. Uh, they try to, uh, you know, make the next incident just a little bit more extreme until they, both cars can barely move. So if you get a chance to go to YouTube and go Malcolm in the Middle Road Rage, you'll be able to see this video. 
what we can find from most articles, and this is why I wanted you to do this, is realize that the outcome will never be what you want. A lot of people say, well, I'm going to get justice. I want them to, to, to learn something about, you know, fairness. I'm going to prove to them that uh, they've got to change the way that they look at driving. Well, you're not really out there to be a teacher. Um, you're not going to really change someone's opinion or attitude uh, by tailgating them or cutting them off or flipping them off or beeping your horn. All these situations that will escalate a situation. But I will tell you guaranteed, if you have a police officer around, that these things will happen. Uh, guaranteed people will probably crash into one another. They will use their vehicle as a weapon. So now you're dealing with a uh, crash report, accident report, dealing with insurance companies. Um, never leave your vehicle. Physical confrontations, I would highly um, discourage anybody getting out of a vehicle when there's um, someone that's really mad because you don't know what they're going to do, what they have, how they're going to actually um, confront you. But if police are around, jail time and tickets. Guaranteed. Every state has an aggressive task force that drives around looking for people that are driving erratically. So let's break it down into what's going to happen to you mentally and physically. Okay, I want you to write this down. First of all, I want you to realize it changes what you perceive as important. You no longer are thinking about going to school. You're no longer thinking about going to work. You're thinking about, I want to pay that person back. I want to teach them a lesson. So you become preoccupied. Okay, that's the only thing that you're thinking about. You, you're going to miss a lot of signs, by the way. Your, your, your driving is going to be so narrow focused that you're missing speed limits, stop signs, traffic lights, and you're going to probably break the law in, in a lot of cases to, to keep up with, you know, getting to a vehicle that's upset you. Most of the time, road rage is not solution-based, meaning that there is no resolve. There's no coming to the minds of, you're not both going to shake hands, go, you know what? I'm sorry I did this. And they're going to go, oh, oh, I'm sorry I did this. And it's not going to be, you know, hugging each other and everybody's fine. It doesn't, it does never, it never happens that way. And the other thing is it takes time to overcome. You will be shaken. You physically and mentally, it, it will be on your mind for a while. It could be half of a day, you know, a good portion of the school day. You're, it's still going through your mind what just happened. But then over time, it does kind of go away. What does it do to you physically? Physically, your blood pressure. If we were to hook up some of these devices to you, like a blood pressure cuff, your blood pressure would be through the roof. Your heart rate will be faster. You're going to show tension. Your face may look tense. Uh, body language, um, you know, the way that you hold yourself. Um, you could be shaking. I don't know if you've ever been in a bad situation, but you've been so nervous about what's happened, your, your hands actually shake. Kind of like when you're, you know, on, on caffeine. Same type of thing. So what we want to do is to kind of get away from the situation and calm down. So... This is what we need to do. We need to think about, first of all, did we contribute to the problem? Did we cut somebody off? Maybe we didn't use a signal. Maybe we were going too slow. So maybe w there were some things behind the wheel that we could have done differently. But you can't change the situation. That's the next thing. Remember, you can't change the situation. And payback is never a positive outcome. So that means bumping his car, slamming on your brakes, doing a brake check, it, it never it never turns out the way that you hope. You think, I'm going to have them ram into me and I'm going to get a brand new car. It doesn't usually happen that way. They find you to be at fault because you brake checked and the insurance company won't pay you the full value of your vehicle and you're not weeks away from getting a, uh, your car fixed or getting a new car. Uh, all situations that you never, ever thought about. So when it comes to time, Pull over to the side of the road and just relax. Take a deep breath. Go, man, I can't believe that I cut that person off and he flew off the handle at me. Um, 
And when you do pull over, make sure you do it someplace that's safe and also around other people because you just never know when they could come back for another, uh, you know, piece of you, um, you know, bump your car or, you know, start banging on it. Um, I'm going to show you in a moment the, um, I, I don't have any of these. I have the 2020 thing. Okay, so um, let me show you the 2020 report on road rage. They, I believe this is Denver. We all have it in us, even if we don't know exactly where it is. <laughs> a limit, a breaking point, a dark place where civilization ends and animal instinct takes over. And there may be no faster way to get there than right here on the roadways of America at the intersection of velocity and violence. Oh, we have two victims here. You've seen the stories leading your local news. Another case of road rage. And polluting YouTube. What feels like a daily diet of road rage reports. Just last week, this shocking video of an incident on a California freeway <gasps> leading to a multi-car crash. Call 911, Chris. Nearly half of all drivers surveyed have experienced some form of road rage. Here in Denver, the Mile High City, drivers have hit new lows. Local officials reporting deadly traffic crashes have been slowly creeping up for several years. We know you're fed up. So are we. We came to see for ourselves. It didn't take long for us to find it. Rocky Mountain Rage. Ali, that guy. He was like almost in our lane. You want reasons? Look around. The city's rush hour turns freeways into ant farms. It's a stop and go sea of brake lights. Yeah, it's not moving up there. What typically should be a 30 minute commute can take nearly an hour and a half, enough to turn any driver into a ticking time bomb. I was surprised at how bad the traffic is in Denver. It's heavy, heavy, it's crowded, and it's aggressive. Captain Jeff Goodwin of the Colorado State Patrol is fighting the uphill battle against an army of hot-tempered motorists. Don't touch me! There is that group of individuals that get up helter-skelter every morning. They're never on time. So now they're running late and they've got to make up that time. So how do they do it? They do it by pushing people out of the way, cutting them off, changing from the inside left lane all the way to the exit ramp right as they get there. Goodwin believes he's pinpointed the root of the problem. With more than 100,000 people transplanting to Denver every year, it's as simple as too many metal machines, not enough pavement. I used to think it was something like people cutting you off. But, you know, one of the things that people really get angry about, if somebody honks the horn at you because you've sat too long at a light, I think they literally go from the Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde. Around the country, it's not just gangbangers and street thugs mixing it up. It could be any of us. Take a look at these guys in business attire doing the WWE Smackdown. We showed the good Captain Goodwin some examples of bad behavior, and he provided us some potentially life-saving road rules to help you. Rule number one, don't make eye contact. This motorist is out of control. And this victim is doing all the right things. Just stare ahead, don't engage. Right, yeah, the minute you engage, who knows where this goes. Rule number two, never approach the window. All right, wow, okay. This is more than over the top because now you have a gun involved. So you're gonna pull your gun out? What kind of, just You never know who's packing heat. Exactly. Is approaching someone's window ever a good idea? Never do it. And most important, rule number three, you don't always have to win. It looks like it's gonna be over, but as we see in this case from Houston, the parties involved just can't help themselves. And here we go, there you go. I mean, now they're at full-blown fist fight. Right, this is what happens. It gets worse. The longer this goes, the worse it's gonna get. It looks like they just need to win the argument. That's what it is. Oh, oh. It was 4.15 when we hit the road with Goodwin and his team. 
They prowled the interstate looking for bad behavior. We're looking for aggressive drivers. Triggers. Holy s***. Which often lead to the road rage we see on the news. This is a 75 mile. Well, we're doing 17 and a 75 at rush hour. Uh, I got a lady who was texting if you want to pull her over. Within minutes, Goodwin's team has spotted a common breed, a texter at the wheel. Goodwin says distracted driving, the number one offense that sends drivers into road rage. And how does that end up leading to road rage? Well, when she's texting, she's not paying attention to everybody else out here. Next, we cross paths with a lead foot speedster, the deadliest kind of aggressive driver. I could see him in the rear view mirror weaving in and out. He was trying to find that opening. And that's when people get mad. Right. It was now 5.45, the road rage witching hour. Yeah, we're pulling out. Goodwin says the peak time for trouble. And the cops had busted this aggressive driver for skipping the off ramp and blazing her own trail altogether. Right now, there's a warrant for your arrest. Her prize? Some new bracelets and a ride in the fast lane to the county clink. She doesn't have a valid driver's license either, so that's been canceled and denied, so she shouldn't be driving anywhere. We'd found ourselves at a notorious hot spot. So this is the, uh, the frontage road where we have a lot of our issues. And got a dose of full frontage fury. So people will be frustrated. They'll come off the frontage road, and then they actually will do this, believe it or not. They will drive here. Holy cow, this is so and steep. And they will find that steep drop down to the interstate, and they will bounce their way back down into Interstate 25, all because they're angry about sitting in traffic. Off-roading on I-25. Yeah. As Friday rush hour traffic mounts once again, we spot this guy who thought he could make up time bypassing all the drivers ahead of him, riding along the road's shoulder. But he's going nowhere fast today. Go over here. Hey, sir, do me a favor and stay in your car while we do this business, OK? You passed about seven or eight cars going alongside them on the right. You went over the white shoulder. That's not a lane for turning. It's not a lane for passing. Like many road rogues, this guy's idea of defensive driving is making excuses for his alleged moving violations. He even called 911 to complain about being pulled over. He stopped me first on the train track with the train coming down the road. And now that he's caught, he's upset. Just is not in agreement at all with what's going on here. So that's his beef. There goes the guy. There he goes. Next. Check out this blue truck. The driver has jumped the median, passing up other cars, hightailing it the wrong way into oncoming traffic. Captain Goodwin pulls him over, hand on the holster. What was it? I haven't seen anybody drive that aggressively in years. He's doing about 90 miles an hour. He damn near hit several cars back there. I charged him with reckless driving. He just didn't plan on having any law enforcement around to stop him today. You don't think it's just a Y chromosome thing. You see a lot of aggressive driving from both sexes. Everybody drives crazy. Yeah, it's... <laughs> Okay, this is what I'd like you to do in the comment section of YouTube right here. We all get angry, and some of us will even get mad when we when we drive, possibly. So what I want you to do, I want you to write down something in the comment section that would tend to get you a little upset, all right? I'm going to give you um, a good example. All right, so you can't use mine, all right? High beams coming behind you, all right? Can't use that one. So you're gonna have to think of other things. What driving behavior is going to start to get to you, all right? Now, you can copy what other people say up here, okay? So I'm gonna look in the comment section as we uh, move along. So we're gonna transition into what we're gonna talk about tonight, which is bad weather driving. So we're going to talk about snow, sleet, ice, rain, fog, nighttime driving, all these things. Uh, last week we had a little bit of snow, so we're not totally 
out of the woods when it comes to winter weather. Uh, it is supposed to get a little bit colder tonight, um, but I don't think we have any snow in the forecast. Um, yeah, break check. I'm going to see the answers as they come in. Yep, that would get you. If you take a look at this picture right here, I want you to think about this. If we started to go around the picture and count the vehicles, and I think at one time I saw like seven or eight cars, and then um, we see about six or seven tractor trailers. So we basically have a huge uh, tie-up. What I want you to realize when it comes to bad weather, it can be broken down into two reasons why. So what I want you to write down, the two reasons why we have people crashing, crashing into one another is speed and following distance, okay? So I want you to remember that for all bad weather, if you can control your speed, if you can control your following distance, you should be okay. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, there's always going to be situations where you just hit a patch and you're just not ready for it. You've got good slow speed, but for whatever reason, maybe the slope of the road, it throws you into a spin. Yeah, I get it. There are going to be situations, but far too many times when you see a crash in the wintertime, People make it just seem like it was an accident. It was like nothing could have changed the outcome. There was nothing that they could have done. But in reality, it was they were going slightly too fast for the conditions. And they were much closer than the following distance that they should have had. Because even in this picture right here, think about it. If everybody's going 30, 35 miles per hour and cars are starting to slip and slide and go all over the place. Guess what? 30, 35 is too fast. You can't say, well, I'm on an interstate highway. I've got to go 30, 35 because, you know, I've got to get to where I'm going. Yeah, but all the cars in front of you are slipping and sliding. So maybe the safe speed is 25, not 30, 35. So a little bit of an adjustment, a little bit better following distance. And I think a lot of people would have had better outcome. Now, there are three types of winter weather that I want you to write down. Ice, sleet, and snow. So in order of severity, Ice is the worst, then sleet, then snow. So we're going to take a look at those three types of winter weather. Now, the reason why ice is so bad is because at times you don't even know it's there. Let me show you this little clip. An expressway slick with ice, black ice, thin, nearly invisible to drivers. The ice has caused a car to crash in the fast lane. Trooper Jeff Oaken parks his cruiser to prevent a pileup. But behind him, drivers are approaching way too fast. Okay, uh, we don't get to see it actually happening, but because he had a bus right next to him, he got blocked in. And he was going way too fast that he wasn't going to be able to stop for the police cruiser. And yes, indeed, he does hit the police cruiser. But you're driving down the road and, and you think that you've got control of your vehicle. And that's the, the sneaky thing about ice is because ice can form in patches. And when you've got traction, you think everything is great. But then when you start to lose traction, then you're wishing that you had a slower speed. So... I want you to write down, ice is more of a problem early winter, late winter. Like right now, I would still be concerned about freezing temperatures. Uh, it rained a couple days ago. If the temperature dropped down to freezing, we would wake up in the morning and we would have black ice on the road for about a half hour, 45 minutes, because the heat from your car, the exhaust and the heat from your tires will usually start to thaw out. Uh, thin layers of black ice. But if it had rained and you've got a puddling of, of water on the roadway, it will freeze over and it will become thick and it will not thaw out until later in the day or warmer temperatures. Uh, so that's bad. Now, here's a small compilation of vehicles for whatever reason 
uh, could not get control of their vehicle in winter driving. Now, most of these are European. Now, I'm not saying that European drivers are bad, but I really don't think that they were trained to handle snow the way that they are. Uh, because most of these I look at the situation, I'm thinking, this probably shouldn't have happened. They could have made this a little bit better, but I think you'll get a little kick out of some of the people's bad driving skills and bad weather. So let me show you this winter uh, montage of, of bad driving. portion of that clip where the car was on the highway where it did a 360 and who knows what speed that they were going i will tell you it was one of the scariest moments in the driver's ed car with me i actually had a student do that twice once in farmington new hampshire or really i guess it was rochester we were right on the border uh, on route 11 and then we had this situation in downtown dover where we spun the car almost a 360 all the way around it can happen and it wasn't the students fault well one of them was um they uh, hit the brakes too hard um but the one in dover i mean i didn't see it coming and i thought they were following at a decent distance and the speed was okay but we just had a bad patch of uh roadway ice and with the slope of the road it kind of threw us into a into a spin so these things can happen um i i kind of like this sign Drivers ignoring winter conditions may be subject to natural selection. That's true. Uh, so if you don't learn from your mistakes, you're going to repeat them. Uh, you will get involved in crashes. You'll be stuck in snowbanks and all those other negative things when it comes to winter driving. So let's kind of break down the three winter weathers that I was talking about. So let's talk about ice. Okay, we know ice is frozen water. Uh, like I said, usually early winter, late winter. So November, December, um, probably April, you know, March, April is when we're seeing uh, early morning black ice and be very careful around stop lights and stop signs. That is where you really have to watch out for black ice and areas that are covered by large trees. Large trees have a tendency not to uh, let light you know, come in during the day. 
so these areas don't thaw out very well. Tend to be a little bit cooler. Um, ice is only a traction problem. It's not a vision problem. So when we talk about sleet and snow, we know that is coming from the sky. Ice is usually uh, frozen on the ground. Okay. Where should you drive on the road? This is going to be the answer for every type of bad weather driving. In the tire marks of the cars that are driven before you. We call those tire marks or tire wipes, depending on the textbook, depending on the class that you're taking. But where other cars have gone down the road, you're going to get a clearer contact with the road in those spots. Now, I know that most of the time it's going to be right of center. Your right side of your vehicle will probably be very close to the white line. That's okay. It's bad weather. You want to stay away from the center where other cars could be. So probably right of center in those tire tracks, wipes. Now, the speed you should travel. Now, we're talking really icy situations. We're not talking just a patch of black ice, but you can see cars in front of you um, having problems. So here's the, the, the way to handle bad weather. If you can see in front of you that cars are having a difficult time up the road, whether it be a straightaway or up a hill, gauge whether you're going the same speed as they are. So let's say you're going 25 or 30 miles per hour, and it looks like you're keeping the following distance the same, and all of a sudden they're starting to slip and slide. There should be a red light going off in your head saying, if I get to that point at the same speed I am right now, I'm going to be just like them. So you've got to drop your speed down. You've got to get it down to probably about 20, 15. I firmly believe if you are on extremely slippery roads, 15 or below is the speed you should be traveling. Now, the reason being, and I mentioned this many weeks ago when we talked about safety equipment, if you're going 15 or below, if you were to bump into another car, you're not going to seriously damage the vehicle and you're not going to get hurt cars are built to withstand impact at 15 miles per hour especially bumper to bumper the nice thing by going below 15 your airbag won't come out if you're going 18 19 you hit a car in front of you your airbag's coming out now you're going to look at the front of your car and there's going to probably be very little damage bumper to bumper but now you've got to buy a new airbag and they can be you know, pretty expensive, well over $1,000 to get it reinstalled. Here's ice. And like I said, it just forms on the road. You don't see it. So overnight, it's, um, you know, being on the roadway and then it freezes. Um, yes, I... Um, I'm just trying to write an answer here. Um, I don't mind driving with students in bad weather as long as we can do it safely. There does come a time when it's not safe for you. It's not safe for other people on the road. But I'm a firm believer that you're here to learn. So if we can put you in a situation, I'd much rather have you have something bad happen with me than with your parents or, or by yourself. I mean, I like my car, but I'm not in love with my car. So, you know, if we did get a scrape or a bump or, you know, a fender bender, those things happen. You know, that's why I have insurance. Not that I'm, you know, you know, looking to get in a crash or anything, but I, I do understand that's just the nature of, of training, that things are going to get used and abused, and that's just part of it. But if we can't safely maneuver the vehicle for a long period of time, then it's probably best that we don't drive. So I, I have canceled out on students for winter weather if we were scheduled and I could see that it was going to progressively get worse. But as long as it's, um, you know, and I still can remember one night after class, I had to bring someone home. So I, we had to get home um, and it, it was icy. It was rain that was freezing on contact and uh, it, it was pretty slippery and we were going probably, 15, 20 miles per hour the, the whole way. Now, what I want you to write down in your notes, where icy conditions will always be, it will be on bridges. 
because you have air circulation above the bridge and below the bridge and bridges are made out of metal, even though we've got pavement that we're driving on, it will conduct or hold the cold temperature longer and quicker. So you're going to find much worse driving conditions on overpasses. So make sure that you remember that for the final. Uh, let's talk about sleet. So water that's coming from above that is freezing on contact or freezing as it comes down. And I heard this morning on the news and I didn't write it down, but she used a different uh, word for sleet. And she said it was just before the water gets to the freezing point. It's kind of like sledge or sludge or something like that. She had a name for it. I'm going to have to look it up again. I go, I've never heard that term before. But I guess there's names for different types of, you know, sleet or freezing rain. Uh, here it is, a traction problem and a vision problem. And I would almost say uh, it gets to be more of a vision problem. We know we could go slow. We know to stay in the tire wipes. We know to go slow. But what we don't do is we don't take time at stop signs, traffic lights to scrape our windows, to roll our windows down. At times we blindly pull away out into the roadway without getting a full representation of what's happening. So I find more people making mistakes in winter driving from vision than from traction. Uh, the speed, I'd go slightly faster than you do with ice. So between 15 and 25, um, especially if the road is 30, 35, I'd stay within that, that realm, staying in those tire wipes, those tire marks where other cars have driven. And then let's talk about snow. Now, with snow, you need to remember that snow comes in, you know, different forms. And the two that come to mind is dry snow, which is very cold temperatures, and it kind of is like um, confetti. It just blows away. It doesn't stick on contact. It just goes off your vehicle. The worst type of snow is wet snow because it will stick to the side of your car, to your windows, it does stick to the inside uh, tire grooves of your tire. And it does create your tire to become like a slick. And your tires will spin a lot quicker on wet snow than on dry snow. So we have a vision and traction problem with snow. Um, stay right of center in those tire marks, tire wipes. But the speed limit, depending on the type of snow. So if it's dry snow, you could probably go the speed limit. Yeah, you probably could. Um, but once again, if you see people having problems up ahead, that's a, a sign I've got to adjust what I'm doing. If it's wet snow, I'm a firm believer, always start at least 10 to 15 below. See if you've got the traction that you need and then adjust accordingly. It's always better to err on the side of caution when it comes to slippery surfaces, meaning start super slow, Build yourself up to the point where you start to feel uncomfortable. The car is kind of moving a little bit. And then I would back off from that and stay at that speed. Now, the other thing that we learned when we talked about speed is that speed is the maximum speed you can travel during ideal conditions. And that was a, a test question on one of the signs. Okay. That is the maximum speed ideal conditions. So even though the road is posted for 55, does not mean a snowstorm, you can go 55. If everybody's going 35, you've got to go the prevailing speed of everybody. And now that we have LED signs on highways, it's very common for what they call a winter advisory speed to be in effect while you're driving in winter weather. So stay in the right lane, watch your signs, keep your following distance and driving in a snowstorm won't be bad. But if it's a wet snow, hold on tight because it's going to get kind of tricky. And like I said, sometimes you think you've got traction. The next moment, uh, you don't. The last question, I'm going to get out of this here for a second so you can see me for a moment, is what if I become stuck in the snow and I can't get out? Um, I am standing behind my stand-up desk right now. I'm going to put my hands up a little bit. If this is the back of a vehicle and you're stuck and you're going to have someone push your vehicle, and this is going to be a question. If you did your reading uh, chapter, I think it was 13. Let's see what was tonight. 
Yeah, 13. In chapter 13, they talk about this. They talk about rocking the vehicle. So I'm moving back and forth. So notice I'm going back, then forward, back, then forward. And what you're doing is that you're pushing the vehicle while it's in drive, and then the driver is putting in reverse. And the car is going back as far as it can go, and then you're pushing it forward and drive again. They're putting in reverse, it goes back. And each time you push and, and it comes back, it's going to go a little bit higher out of the rut that you're stuck in. You're trying to get your tire out of a particular rut. So depending on what the tire is. But when you push your vehicle, and I don't know if they really cover this in the textbook, but you're not supposed to push a car from behind, meaning directly where the license plate is. What you need to do is to push it off, off from the side. So you put one hand on the back of the vehicle and the other one on the side of the vehicle and you and you push from the side forward. So if the car ever comes out on the reverse, coming back out of that little rut, it's going to go out of the rut and it won't run you over. So if you push right behind it and they're going drive, okay, it it's going to come out one of these days when you're standing right behind it. And you're going to get all that snow and slush that the spinning tires are uh are getting you um oh let's see if i can come back do i have it okay um you can't see it i'm gonna just take off the top here a little bit so you can see okay these are what we call um tire mats or, or tire grips these orange metal um trifolds have those um, jagged edges and you just open this up and you stick it underneath your tire and your car can actually roll right on top of the top of this and it allows you to get out with just you in the car because a lot of times you go well wonder if I get stuck and I don't have someone to push my vehicle to rock my car how do I get out well it's to buy something like that that you can just keep in your car um, I've had this for years and all the um, paper stickers and stuff are coming off it i've had to use it a couple times so it has come in handy so i highly recommend it you could probably find it on amazon i'll try to find a copy on amazon and i'll throw it um on the the board tomorrow when we talk about it uh back to getting stuck in the snow um i think i want to take this time right now to talk about things that you should do uh prior to driving in snow I'm sure your parents will trust you eventually because most of you have probably never driven in the snow. So your first experience is going to be by yourself because you're going to be done driver's ed in the next couple of weeks and you're going to get your license hopefully in May and June, July. Um, so you're going to have three or four months of driving before the first snow comes and it's going to be a new experience. So even though we covered it here in class, uh, I'm sure you're not going to remember everything. But I do hope that you do remember this. And this is not found in any textbook. This is not found in any state manual. This is coming to you from a driving instructor that is also a father. I have three children. And one of the things that I always asked my children to do if they were driving in bad weather was one of three things or to do three things. First of all, and I want you to write this down. Um, I think your parents are going to really appreciate that you're going to put this into practice is first of all, Always call your parents when you're ready to leave to come home from someplace. Let me give you an example. My son used to like to go to Newington, go to the movies and hang out in the Portsmouth area. And I, I live in Rochester, so it's about a 20-minute drive. So if it was a light snow, and I don't mind him being out in a snowstorm. He was a good driver. But I did ask him, let me know when you're coming home. So I hit call. Dad, it's 1030. The movies just got out. I'm coming home. Okay, great. The second thing that I always asked of him is let me know who's in the car with you dad i've got mike and hunter with me okay who are you going to take home first i'm going to go mike and then i'm going to bring hunter home the reason why i wanted to know who's in the car and who's going to be brought home first is i don't want phone calls from angry parents saying hey your son you know picked up my son and they were going out where are they and you know how come they're not home yet uh i want to be able to give an update you know they just left the movies they're going to bring mike home first and then hunter 
the reason being why I want to know who's going to be first is because if they don't ever get to Mike's house, I know the route that he would probably take. I know where Mike lives and I know his dad and I would know exactly how to trace from the movies to Mike's house and then from Mike's house to Hunter's house. So give your parents a heads up about this stuff. They'll, they'll really appreciate, and it doesn't have to be a phone call. It could be a text message just, just in case. Now you've probably heard this. Always have your charger in your car. Okay. Cars can charge phones. There's going to be nothing worse than if you get stuck. And by the way, if your car leaves the road and it can't be seen by other vehicles, let's say it goes down a ravine or something, you know, 50, 60 feet off the road, you could be there for hours, if not, you know, more than a day until they send a search, you know, so have a charged phone and, you know, cell coverage around here is pretty good, but wonder if you're in a place that doesn't have good cell coverage. This is why it's good to do what I just mentioned before that you've left a audible um, voice message or a text message, letting people know that you're leaving where you're going and who's in the car. So that's just um, something I always thought was a wise thing to include in dealing with winter weather. Um, this is Photoshop. Yes, it is. I, I always tell people extreme snow conditions. Does it ever seem like when you're at a stop sign or traffic light, you can't see? It's like, wow, how am I going to pull away from this bad situation? Sometimes the snow bankings do seem to be that tall. So that is uh, truly Photoshopped. But I will tell you, there will come a year that the snow will be so high that it will cover the top of a vehicle. And I'll show you a picture in a moment uh, of such case. And I think I was talking to somebody today, I can't remember who it was, is there are two things you gotta remember when you come to a stop sign or traffic light where you can't see. You have to stop at your stop line or where the sign is and then creep yourself out, which we call safety stops. First one's legal, then your safety stops until you have a somewhat clear view of pulling out into traffic. You do not wanna blindly hope that nobody's coming and then pull out in front of them. And by the way, this uh, snapshot is a real picture. Uh, this was taken in Presque Isle, Maine. This is where my son-in-law lives. Uh, he lives up in, or he did live up in Presque Isle, but look at it, it's higher than the cab of that semi. So that is definitely over um, nine to 10 feet high, those snow bankings. That is a lot of snow. That's a lot of snow. So what do I tell people about how should I approach learning to drive in snow? Go to an empty parking lot, go to a back road, get a feel of what your car is able to do. It says get a feel for the road. You should do this in a safe area. So parking lot, back roads. You need to realize too, stopping is gonna be much different. So it says here three times, just do it early. Get a feel for the road. Are, are you losing contact? because it's giving you that added distance to bring your vehicle up to the stop sign. Make sure that your tires are replaced or snow tires are put on in November. So snow tires, all weather radial tires are good. Uh, know the difference between ABS, that's anti-lock braking system, and know how to use them. And I'll show you a, a video clip in a minute. Make sure your car has a working defroster so it heats the inside of the car and the windows. Make sure that you have a brush that you can clear snow. It's against the law to drive with more than, a, I believe, an inch of snow that's on your hood, roof, or trunk of your vehicle. So make sure you clear all of it. I'm a firm believer of driving a car that is well uh, warmed up because you have fluids in your vehicle and when you jump in your car and think you're going to put it in drive and move it and it's below freezing, even though those fluids don't freeze solid, they do get thicker. And when they become thicker, you don't steer as well. You don't have your brakes working as well. So I would recommend, you know, five to 15 minutes, 15 for much colder temperatures. Uh, you could get away with probably five, but uh, warm it up, get the fluids kind of, you know, thinned out a little bit, get the car warm. Get the warm air on the window so you can defrost them, and then you can probably head out. Watch for bad spots on the roadway. Have your eyes peel for where you think black ice may be forming. And carbon monoxide poisoning is real. 
meaning that if you are in a parked vehicle or a driveway and you're warming up your car, but the tailpipe uh, is not exposed, it's covered with snow, some of the exhaust fumes are lingering inside your car. So when you get in, um, you're going to start feeling the effects of carbon monoxide poisoning, which is feeling tired, sick to your stomach, uh, all feelings that are normal. Okay. Um, so crack your window. If you have any doubts whether the inside of your car is starting to get some of the fumes that are working their way back up inside your vehicle. Let me show you the winter weather school. Oh, here's someone warming up their car. I thought it was kind of ironic that he got a ticket for warming up his car in his own driveway. I guess it's because the doors weren't locked. You can't actually leave a car running with the doors open. But how, I was wondering, how do they know the doors are not locked? Well, anyways, so just be careful about these minor, small laws in other states. We don't have that here in New Hampshire. Uh, here's the winter, winter weather school. I think we have three of these in New Hampshire. This one's down in Denver. Uh, so if you want to get like a reduction in your insurance policy, you can take one of these classes and they're going to probably drop your rates a little bit. Plus, it's a good training. I haven't had a chance to go through it. I've had people that I know that have and they seem to enjoy it. They put you into a, a small classroom for a couple hours, talk about when to brake, how to approach turns, how brakes work and steering. And then they actually take you out to a, a course that has ice and snow on it. And you get to feel what it's like to lose control and how to regain control. So here is the winter school. Looking for a new car or truck? TheAutoChannel.com has the most complete and up-to-date pricing, vehicle specifications, and reviews. While driving on ice and snow can be a frightening experience if you're not mentally and physically prepared, there really are no deep, dark secrets to controlling your vehicle in difficult circumstances. The Bridgestone Winter Driving School features purpose-built tracks designed to duplicate the most challenging, real-world driving situations. It is critical to clear all snow and ice from your vehicle, including the roof. Snow left on your roof will quickly obscure the rear window, and when you begin to drive, large chunks of flying snow can block the vision of drivers beside or behind you. To steer smoothly and correctly, place your hands at the 9 and 3 o'clock position on the steering wheel. Keeping your hands on opposite sides of the steering wheel allows you to steer through a corner efficiently and precisely. Do not attempt to deflate your tire to gain a bigger contact patch with the road surface because this will only lessen the performance of your tire. Only a properly inflated tire offers maximum grip. Also, remember tire pressure can change according to the outside temperature. Tire pressures drop 1 psi for every 10 degrees in temperature drop. Also, check your tire pressures regularly to ensure proper inflation. This is especially important in late fall or early winter as temperatures begin to drop. The number one rule of safe winter driving is to adjust your speed to the current conditions. These conditions include the type of tire, road surface, visibility, the type and weight of your vehicle, and your driving ability. With the traction control and stability control systems in today's cars, many people become overconfident or simply complacent. These systems can help drivers by alerting them to improper responses or correcting small mistakes, but they can't overcome the laws of physics. If your car is equipped with standard brakes, the most effective way to stop in an emergency situation is to use the pumping technique. Most drivers are aware of this concept of pumping the brakes, but don't really understand the proper technique. So what I'd like you to do, and he mentioned this, is how much tire pressure do you lose with a temperature drop? He gave an example. So what I want you to do is to text me on your phone, so not on the comment section. So we're about a little bit more than halfway through today. So I want to see who's still here with us. So he gave you, if, you're, if the temperature drops by a certain amount, so you got to write down what's the temperature drop, you're going to lose how many... PSIs, pounds per square inch. So put that in your answer on a text message and send that along. Now, here is another uh, example of what to do in winter driving. Looking for a new car or truck? TheAutoChannel.com has the most complete. There's also ice. 
Ice on a roadway isn't like ice in a glass of water. You don't necessarily see it. If it's a sunny day, you can have glare on the road and it just appears that the roadway is wet when actually there, there is ice on the road and it can catch you by surprise. If you have to drive on ice, slow down to a crawl. When it's freezing or near freezing, be extra careful on bridges, overpasses and streets shaded by trees or buildings. These areas tend to freeze before the rest of the roadway and they're the last to thaw out. If it's icy and you approach a curve, slow down before you get to the curve. If you suddenly slow down or speed up while turning, you will go into a skid. Like ice, snow can be deceptive too. Once it starts to pack down and then you have temperature changes where it melts some, freezes, melts some, freezes, then you end up with that icy condition again. And yes, you can see it, but it can still be very deceptive in terms of how slippery it will actually be. Again, it's essential to slow down. If you're driving in packed snow, cut your speed to half of what you'd normally drive. To increase traction, use snow tires or tire chains placed over the tire tread. Whether you're driving in snow or rain, the American Automobile Association gives seven tips for safer driving. One, prepare in advance. Clean your windows and lights. Check the tread and pressure of your tires. Check your windshield wipers, headlights, and other equipment to make sure they're in good working order. Two, be extra careful. Drive slower and allow extra space between your car and others. Three, drive in the tracks of the vehicle in front of you. Since those tracks are drier than the surrounding pavement, they provide better traction. Four, give plenty of advance notice to other drivers. If you plan to turn or slow down, let other drivers know early enough so that they have time to react safely. Five, be alert. Watch for pedestrians trying to get out of the weather. Six, keep your low beam headlights on. This helps you to see better and helps others to see you. And seven, ease your way into turns or curves, avoiding any sudden starts and stops. A few tips for when you and bad weather meet out on the highway. I'm Ryan Wickram. Okay, most of you are getting the uh, answer that I was looking for correct, so it's good that you are paying attention and uh, getting this uh, information. Very good. Um... We've kind of already talked about this, so I'm not going to go over this. Just realize that a red flag on your vehicle means that you don't have electrical power. So when we talk about a disabled vehicle, we're talking about you, you have no abilities to use your emergency flashers. Okay. Um, staying in the car makes sense because uh, people sometimes walk and get hit by cars trying to get help, especially at night. So try to keep passengers warm. I always carry uh, an extra coat and gloves and stuff and throw it in my trunk in the winter time. Make sure that you have fresh air coming in, especially if the tailpipe is somewhat covered by snow. You might not be able to get out to check to see if it's clear. Um, and then just realize that if you've got a cell phone and GPS, they're going to probably be able to locate you. Uh, fog is a weather condition that we have to be worried about. So what I want you to write down is fog is a vision problem. It has nothing to do with traction. So you can't see. So from this picture right here, um, there are actually, I believe, um, four cars. There's one in the bottom corner. Then there's two that we see in the middle portion of the picture. But there are actually, I believe, one or two cars coming down a hill that don't have their headlights on. This is why it's so important to have um, fog lights or low beams on. Let me show you the, the clip. Fog is considered the most dangerous of all driving hazards. The best advice for driving in fog is don't. It's simply hard to see what's around you. If you must drive, then slow down and turn on your low beam headlights. The low beams help you to see and help others to see you. Driving instructor Zandrea Baldwin emphasizes to use low beams, not high beams. If you have your high beams on, the glare is going to come back toward you from the fog. The fog is pretty much like a light. And if your light is shining against the fog, it's going to glare back into your 
to your um, windshield and it could actually cause temporary blindness. Because of the reduced visibility, it's vitally important to slow down and stay slowed down. Also, use the right edge of the road as a guide rather than the center line. This can help you to avoid running into oncoming traffic or from becoming distracted by oncoming headlights. And don't be too proud to ask for help. Get your passengers involved. Have the passengers help you out, checking blind spots and things of that nature for you. If the fog gets really thick, signal and pull off the road to a protected area. Then wait for the fog to let up. While pulled over, turn on your emergency flashers to make your car more visible to others. A final note, whatever you do, don't stop in the middle of the roadway, no matter how thick the fog is, that almost guarantees that someone will hit you from behind. Again, it's best not to drive in the fog at all. If you have to, stay alert. I'm Katina McHenry. Okay, let's go over some of the things that they talked about in the video, and I thought that they did a pretty good job. Uh, because it's a vision problem, you probably can't go your regular speed. Remember, we're trying to look 20, 30 seconds up ahead. That way we can figure out what's happening. But with fog, we're sometimes limited to maybe 50 feet to 100 feet only in front of us. And the reason why they say you're low beam is because it does angle your lights down. And when high beams, which is a little bit of a higher uh, position light, is that the fog becomes like a sheet and you only illuminate what's about 8 to 10 feet in front of you. Whereas if it's a little bit lower, it, 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 there's a transition that you're able to see a little bit beyond the edge of your low beams. Try to look towards what they call the right edge marking, which is a white line. In the state of New Hampshire, we like to call the white line the fog line. So when you go for your driving test, if they say that you were driving on the fog line too much, they're talking about the white line. You never know when there are going to be other cars around that don't have headlights on. So this is why you want to go slow and stay towards that fog line. Uh, be ready for anybody that's in front of you that uh, doesn't have good vision. They're going to hit the brakes a lot quicker than normal. So this is why you want to stay back more than the four, uh, four second distance that you normally would. So about five or six seconds, it's probably um, uh, better for you. And then if it's so heavy, the fog is you probably should pull over. Uh, put your flashes on and let people um, know where you are and just wait because fog basically rolls in and rolls out. It doesn't stay right where it is for a long period of time. It does, you know, over a couple of minutes start to thin out a little bit. And what I want you to write down in your notes is fog, which is moisture in the air. We find moisture when we have a decrease or increase of temperature. So most of the time that you find fog, it will be early morning or late afternoon because that's where we have the temperature jumps of, you know, 20, you know, degrees one way or the other. And you'll usually always find fog around water. Have you ever been to a lake or an ocean early in the morning? You can see the fog kind of drifting in or out. It's the same thing when you're on the roadway near a marsh or bog or river or brook. There's going to be some fog in the morning. Okay, until the sun warms everything up and it just burns it off, the moisture in the air. I thought this was an interesting article um, because there were so many cars involved. This was in California. Of course, California on the border of the uh, Pacific Ocean. So they were going too fast. And in the article, 194 cars. Can you imagine that? 194 cars ran into one another. Can you imagine how long it took the tow truck to pull all these cars apart? And can you imagine the, the weight? Okay, you're not getting to work or getting to school if you're stuck. And by the way, I want you to write this down. Most people don't realize this. If it is bad weather, snow or fog, always, 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 always drive in the right lane. Reason being is that if there is a massive collision like you have right here you are to the right edge you're going to be the closest to the breakdown lane to the dirt and to the off-ramp if you're in the middle lane left lane you're stuck you're not going anywhere until they pull all the cars apart so in bad weather stay to the right and be ready to move to the breakdown lane go to the dirt go up to the next exit and look for a minor road to get to where you want to go you're going to have at least an out think of that you're going to have an out a place to travel 
to the right of you if you're always in the right lane in super bad weather. Uh, what I want you to take a look at on the right side of this article, it says that they could only see 50 feet and the heavy fog. And this was at seven in the morning and they were only going between 25 and 35 miles per hour. And you wouldn't think that it was very fast. But um, in the old state manual, they actually gave a guide of what you need for stopping distance. And um, you basically needed like uh, 73 feet at 30, 35 miles per hour. So they were well, if they could only see 50 feet, there's 20, 25 feet that was unaccounted for. And this is why they were all, you know, running into one another. Yet they thought they were driving at a decent speed and a, a decent following distance, but they were all wrong. Okay, I want to talk about three types of weather conditions that we really don't have here in New England. Although we have had this winter some pretty high wind situations. Now, we call that buffering. And when you're on the roadway, especially in wide open areas like a field or over a bridge, you're going to feel your car, what we call buffer, um, where it moves to the right or to the left a few inches to a foot. Uh, but do realize that the larger your vehicle, the higher your center of gravity, it's going to create a condition. Now, these clips were all of tractor trailers. Now, most of these trailers, I should say all of them, uh, probably had an empty load. Okay. They had an empty trailer. So they had, they didn't have the weight to keep them stabilized on the road. It's amazing. Even when you think about how tall and heavy a tractor trailer is, even with the cab, you wouldn't think that it would tip over, but I thought these were um, quite telling. This is one reason why you should be very careful of who you ride up next to on a highway. Whether it be high winds or even in snow, you probably should stay away from some of these vehicles. It looks like just lifting it right off the ground. So you get the, the point, high winds, high center of gravity, um, it's going to create a problem. Now, the next weather condition that we don't have around here, because we don't live in the, the Midwest, uh, in a desert area, the windstorms can kick up loose sand, the fine sand. And what you will see, and I believe this is only two minutes uh, long, this little video clip, the, from the time that I set this in motion to roll, you're going to see that it's going from pretty light. Right now, you can see what's happening in front of you to where you can barely see um, 50, 75 feet in front of your vehicle. It's almost like driving at night in two minutes. Now, in this case, you probably should pull over. And like I said, with fog, a windstorm, too, will pass relatively quickly. So rather than drive... Um, you should probably just wait it out. I, I would have waited it out, but you tell me what you think. So right now it's, it's pretty light out. We don't have any problem with visibility. We can look way up the road, but you will see, and like I said, this is less than two minutes, this video clip. Watch how dark it starts to get.
it almost gives you a sense of what fog would look like. This would almost be like a light fog, actually. Doesn't it seem like you're driving at night? Notice the uh, camera autofocus. Can't even get a clear image of the vehicles in front now. Isn't it hard to believe you're driving? It looks like it's at 10 o'clock at night. And this is in the middle of the day in a sandstorm. And the last thing that I want to talk about, and we do have this around here uh, eventually, is hail. Now, hail is rain that's coming down and crystallizing and clumping together to create large balls of hail. Um, most of the time when you think of hail, you're thinking uh, probably about the size of a uh, eraser on top of a pencil. An eraser on top of a pencil. Now, here he's going to say the hail's coming down in the size of, I think he said grapefruits or, or softballs or something like that. But they're big. And when they get that big, and this is out in the Midwest, um, they're going to break windshields. So what you want to do when you know it's beginning to hail is you've got to hightail it to a gas station to get under one of those underpasses, you know, where they protect you when you pump gas. Or look for a tree. Any tree, get as close as you can under to it so that the branches are uh, somewhat stopping the hail that's coming down because this stuff will dent your car and crack your window. So watch this hailstorm. Oh, and there's that beautiful wall cloud right in front of us. Um, now we're getting baseball size hail. Oh my gosh, bigger than baseball. Woo, -hoo, we're getting close to grapefruits over here. And I got it on camera. Oh my gosh, we've got softball size hail going on. And I just got, yep, I'm okay. I just got glass all over me. We got to get out of this. Yep, that just happened. How are you going to get out of it? We don't no, just keep driving. That's all we can do. I have glass all over me. Don't move. Don't move. I'm, if I'm going to. Oh my gosh. Yep, got that one too. Can we find a place to pull under? Oh my gosh, this is the biggest hell I've ever seen. Oh, and it's all, oh, I'm covered in glass. This, I, I, what do you want me to do? There's nothing you can do, man. Pull up beside that building. We've lost our windshield. Um, uh, this is five to six inch size hail. I mean, it's bigger than softballs or grapefruits. I've never seen this big a hail in my life. Incredible. I've never seen hail this big. An expressway slick with ice. Okay, that, that was pretty bad. Um, he should have pulled over to the side. I saw some trees that he was driving by. I would have gone off the edge of the road and uh, gotten underneath those tree branches. I, I think he didn't handle that uh, very well. Now, the type of weather that we have here is something that happens 12 months out of the year. Right in the middle of January, February, you would think, oh, we're going to get snow. Sometimes it's rain. So rain does create some of its own special problems. So let's talk about that for a moment. Um, rain is really more of a vision problem than traction. We, you, you'll hear the term hydroplane. Hydroplaning is when your tires lift up on top of the water, like water skis. That will happen usually if your speed is too fast and if you have well-worn tires or if the road isn't slope to get most of the water off and it's kind of hanging on the on the pavement a little bit too much so it's usually vision that we have to worry about with rain so we always want to have our headlights on so people can see us um, we want our defroster in the front and back to clear the windows because we don't have wipers on a four-door car you do on SUV so activate those um, you should know that Rain in the summertime can be a little bit difficult 
in the first half hour. That's where it mixes with the oil. Sometimes oil will drip off your vehicle. Like if you look at a parking spot, you'll see these little black blotches. You see them at stop signs and traffic lights. So when the water starts to form on these little pockets of oil, if your tire was to hit it just right, you could skip. You could slide just a little bit. I mean, it's not extreme, but it's enough to take you by surprise, and it's enough that you could probably you know ram your vehicle into the curb or into another car if you're at a stop sign. So be very careful at the first part of a rainstorm. Now, after a half hour, it usually washes away that oil, and it doesn't get to be quite is bad of a problem. Now, the, the next bullet with wet leaves, wet leaves can be just as bad as ice because your tires are gripping the top layer of the leaves. The bottom layer is still grabbing hold of the road. So you are sliding, you are, you know, you're, you're basically pushing uh, your tires on the top level of the leaves. So stay away from the right side of the road in the fall time where the leaves will start to uh, accumulate. It is the law to have your headlights on. So I want you to write down the law is a half hour after sunset to a half hour before sunrise. I will test you on the final on this. That is a guarantee. You need to know when your headlights on. Don't put dark till morning. Okay. They're going to only use the words sunset and sunrise. And they're going to screw with your mind and they're going to change the time to a half hour, to 45 minutes, to an hour. And they're going to say dawn up to dawn dusk. And you just got to know. You just got to know the way it's written in the book. So underline it in the manual. Underline it here. So it's a half hour after sunset. So that means at nighttime, having them on all during the evening till a half hour before the sun comes up in the morning. It should always signal and break in rain so people can see what you're doing. And here's a big one, because some of you have not been doing a very good job of missing potholes. You should miss potholes. How do you know it's a pothole? It is darker than the regular pavement. It, you can actually see it just drops down. A puddle will hold water, and it's very subtle. It kind of, the tire can come in nice, and then it comes out. But when it's a pothole, it just drops um, quite severely, and then it comes back up and you can ruin your alignment. You could actually get a um, flat tire if you hit a pothole the wrong way. This is another reason why you want headlights. So in between those red arrows is a car. We can see the ones behind, but there's a car in front of all those uh, lit cars. And we just really don't see them really well. So when you look in your side mirror quickly, this is what we're missing. So let's talk about rain. The weather can present traffic hazards. Take rain. It's a hazard from the moment the first drops fall. This is when rain first mixes with oil and dust on the pavement. It's very slick. This is what happens. The dirt and oil float to the top of the water. So tires ride not only on the slippery surface of water, but also directly on the even more slippery surface of oil and dirt. It's no wonder so many crashes happen just after it starts raining. Eventually, dust and oil wash away, but plenty of hazards remain. Rain, especially heavy rain, limits your ability to see. It's hard for you to see what's going on, and it's hard for other people to see you. In addition to making it difficult to see, rain keeps roads slippery. Traction becomes a critical issue, and hydroplaning, a real danger. Three main factors cause a car, truck to hydroplane, speed, tread depth, and water depth. The faster your car or truck goes, the more traction you lose on a wet surface. The more worn your tires are, and the shallower the tread, the more likely your car is to hydroplane. Even a thin layer of water can cause your car to lose traction. But as the water gets deeper, you lose traction sooner. It all happens in a space no bigger than the bottom of a size nine shoe. Now picture this, it's a smooth roadway, there's moderate rain, and you're traveling at 60 miles per hour. Under these conditions, each tire has to move away about one gallon of water every second. All in a space no bigger than this shoe. Each gripping element of the tread is on the ground even less time, 1 50th of a second. 
During this fleeting moment, the gripping element must move the water from beneath the tire and then grip the road surface. If this doesn't happen, your car may likely hydroplane. When a car hydroplanes, the most important thing that someone needs to remember is don't panic. First, do not brake or accelerate suddenly. Since hydroplaning is a loss of traction to the front tires, sudden braking on a front or rear wheel drive slows the front tires but locks the rear tires. This can cause a spin out. Also, sudden acceleration on a front or rear wheel drive may take the vehicle straight ahead. This could be dangerous if the vehicle is pointed toward the edge of the roadway. According to some driving experts, what you should do depends on the type of vehicle you're in. Listen for the type of vehicle you drive. A front wheel drive with an anti-lock brake system and traction control system. Front wheel drive without an anti-lock brake system and traction control system. A rear wheel drive with an anti-lock brake system and traction control system. If you begin to hydroplane in one of these types of cars, then some driving experts suggest you do this. Look for open space and plan to travel in that direction. Stay slightly on the accelerator and steer gently toward the open space which you have identified. If you are in a rear wheel drive without an anti-lock brake system and traction control system, then do this. Look for open space and plan to travel in that direction. Ease off the accelerator and steer towards the open space which you have identified. Traction control systems, by the way, have been installed in vehicles for a number of years now, but everyone may not be familiar with it. This is a system that prevents tires from spinning under acceleration. If your vehicle has a traction control system, there should be an icon indicating so on your dashboard. Another note, it's important not to have the cruise control engaged in heavy rain due to a sudden acceleration problem. The vehicle will recognize the water buildup as a slowdown and ask for more power. This need for more power may shift, causing the vehicle to shift to a lower gear and build more water under the tires. This causes a cycle of more power and more push on the front tires. You can avoid hydroplaning by making sure the tread on your tires is thick enough and by slowing down. Here's a good rule of thumb for checking your tread. Stick a penny upside down in your tread. If Lincoln's head is hidden, then your tread is thick enough. If the tread doesn't hide Lincoln's head, then your tread is too thin and you need new tires. When it comes to speed on a wet road, slow down by about one third of what you would normally drive. For example, if you normally drive 60 miles per hour on a dry highway, slow down to 40 when it's wet. All good tips for driving in rain because we, like I said, we have it all year long, 12 months a year. So let's talk about hydroplaning. Hydroplaning by defi de definition is your tires are no longer gripping the road. So it's lifting up on the water, riding on top. So the thing to remember, if you're riding on top of water, um, um, you can't accelerate, you can't brake, and you can't steer. All right? You can't brake, you can't accelerate, you can't steer. Um, hydroplaning usually begins right around uh, 35 miles per hour. So if you're going slower than that, you're probably not hydroplaning. Um but be careful on back roads. That is more likely where it's going to happen. So reduce your speed during heavy rain, slushy conditions. Reduce your speed nearing standing water or puddles. As we saw in the video, replace tires. Um, keep them properly inflated. That's going to help uh, push the water away from. And the only reason why you have tread on a tire, think about it, is to get water and snow away from the rubber so your rubber is gripping the roadway the best tire for for traction is a bald tire think of racing any racing vehicle doesn't have tread on a tire they want contact they want rubber on the roadway to accelerate or to brake anytime you're cutting grooves the only re reason why there's grooves is there's something that has to be channeled out of that uh, area and that's rain, sl snow, and, sl and slush. If your car is starting to lose its ability to grip the roadway, try to make sure your vehicle is going straight ahead. And when they mean straight ahead, they're talking about keeping in your lane. They're not talking visually straight. They're just talking about staying in your lane. Always try to steer out of it. 
you know, when you start to hydroplane, let go of the accelerator, wait till the tires regrip the road, and then it's a steering problem. So don't brake, don't accelerate. Once you get contact with the road again, it's steering because you may have a slight angle uh, to your vehicle. Uh, nighttime driving, I want you to write a few things down here before we end for tonight. Nighttime driving, more people die at night than during the day for many reasons. So there's three categories of people that are having fatalities at night, and that would be the older person that doesn't have good night vision. They overcompensate. It's the young person who's distracted or going too fast, and it's the alcoholic uh, or drug driving, and we're going to talk about drunk driving tomorrow night. So these are the three groups of people that are having major, major problems with crashes and fatalities at night. We have a tendency to think we can drive the same speed at night that we do during the day, but your lights normally don't illuminate that well. Low beams shine about 100 feet, high beams about 350. Um, make sure that you do not blind other people so you can't keep your high beams on all the time, so always bring them back down to low. It's kind of nice that cars are actually coming out with automate, automate, auto automatic dimmers so it's dimming the lights for you it's just a built-in thing which i think is kind of cool uh the term uh overdriving your headlights means that you can't stop within the distance your lights illuminate this is why roadkill happens and we'll see something on um driving on roadways with animals uh, a little bit later um probably the last week of class so when a uh, deer or a raccoon, when they wander out in the road at night, usually when they come into the the glare of a headlight, it freezes them. And usually you're going at a speed that you can't stop within the distance that you see. And this is why, like I said, you're going to be hitting more animals at night than you do during the day. And here's that law again. The law says you must have your lights on a half hour after sunset to a half hour before sunrise or any other time where your vision is limited. So let's take a look at driving at night. From sunrise to sunset, drivers have a huge advantage in the sun. Although it's easy to take for granted, the sun makes it immensely easier for us to see. Once darkness falls, driving becomes a whole new ball game. There's no doubt about it. Driving is a lot dicier after the sun goes down. Driving at night does present a whole new set of circumstances for um, any driver, young driver or an older driver. Darkness itself is a hazard. Even people with the best of vision cannot see as well at night. To begin with, your field of vision is less. You actually see a smaller amount of space. Objects are not as sharp, you can't perceive dips and rises as well, and you have a harder time distinguishing colors. A person with excellent vision still needs to remember to slow down and be aware of all the hazards that could present itself at night. You can only see as far ahead as your headlights shine. That makes it harder to see pedestrians, cyclists, animals, obstacles in the road. So go slowly enough so that you can stop within the distance lighted by your headlights. If it's safe, use your high beams, especially on open highways. But always know when to change to low beams. If you approach another car from behind, or if you meet an oncoming car, then switch to low beams. High beams blind other drivers and increase the likelihood of a crash. To avoid being blinded, don't look directly at oncoming headlights. Instead, look to the right edge of your lane and watch the oncoming car out of the corner of your eye. A Couple of other brief points. Never drive with just your parking lights on. Parking lights are designed for parking. They're not a substitute for headlights. And keep your windshield and your headlights clean. They can get real dirty real quick. It's easy enough to do. I give them a quick wipe when I'm at the gas station. It helps reduce glare, it helps the lights to shine brighter, and in general, it helps you to see much better at night. This is Jim Angelo. Okay, we're gonna basically end right here. I'd still wanna kinda go over uh, fatigue driving. That's gonna take up a, a little bit of time. I do wanna give you some time to uh, finish reading uh, and doing your questions for chapter 13 if you haven't sent it in to me. So we've just about covered everything that we need to on this subject. So make sure that you get the questions to me. Chapter 13 tomorrow is chapter 18. Do not worry about the, uh, the changing of uh, rules.
for um, drinking and driving. That's going to be, let me see if I get this over here, change of laws and article. That's going to all be for Thursday. So we've got two days of alcohol and drugs that we've got to go over. Um, like I said, I do have a couple times, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. If people can drive, please let me know. Um, like I said, I know schedules are changing. Uh, you're starting school earlier. I still haven't received anything from the high school. They normally don't send me anything, so I'm going to have to go in tomorrow and kind of find out what your schedule is. But if you're going to be at the high school and you want to drive during a lunch or a free study, uh, let's take advantage of it. I, I've got to really deal with most of you um, between 8 and 3 because I can't give everybody 3, 4, and 5. And I do need people to actually sign up for those too. So I'm going to leave that up there. And that is going to be it for tonight. Tomorrow, like I said, we'll deal with the behavior and attitudes about drugs. And then on Thursday, we'll deal with the consequences. And maybe I'll uh, tack on what we weren't able to finish tonight. Because I really want a section on fatigue. It seems funny that we're talking about fatigue. I don't know if he's still on right now. And I don't know if people can see all the names up here. Or you can remember who's here and who's not. But uh, someone just texted me and said that he fell asleep during class. That's okay. 